Well, my name's George. I'm the pastor here at the gathering. If you're uh, visiting or watching later online, welcome. Good to have you with us. Uh, we've been going through a great series called Images Everything. Say Images Everything. <laughs> and it's been this idea based on the fact that we're created in God's image. And uh, the big idea of the series is that God created us in his image to be a reflection of him so we could enjoy a relationship with him. The more we're like him, the better we know him. And so being, we've looked at how God has made us different male and female and how that really informs the most important roles and relationships that we have in life. We've looked at what it means to, to be a, a son, what it looks like to be a daughter, what it looks like to be a brother, what it looks like to be a sister. We've looked at what it means to be a husband and a wife. And thank you, ladies, for coming back after that one. Um, and now we, we're going to look at what it means to be a biblical father. What does it mean to be a father that's created in the image of God? And uh, before we, we jump into biblical fathers, uh, we need to address something. Uh, so we need to talk about the elephant in the room when it comes to fathers. And the elephant in the room is that talking about our dads can be difficult. It can be challenging. Uh, some had very painful relationships with their father, and that's real. It's a tragedy. They were abusive, angry, violent, distant. Uh, some didn't even have a relationship with their dad. They never knew their dad, and that's difficult and painful. Some have lost their dads, and that hole is huge, and it's, it's glaring in your life. And most people I talk to wish they had a better relationship with their father, whatever that was like. And so I just want to acknowledge that uh, the discussion today, it can bring up uh, painful memories. It can uh, kind of spark and stir up powerful emotions. But my goal today is not to do that. So I have two goals today. Uh, the first goal is to present a redeemed picture of fatherhood. Not one that's based on personal experience, but one that's grounded in biblical truth. And what does the Bible say about it? And then I also want to share a picture of fatherhood that's supported by some encouraging research that the facts bear out about fatherhood. And then I'm going to share, uh, if we have time, share some personal stories. Uh, I was blessed to have a great dad uh, who passed on a legacy of a great understanding of God as a father. Uh, they got to try to improve upon in my generation. And that's all we really can do, right? We, we received a type of, of parenting, and we hope to improve upon that. And that's the goal of today, is to kind of present this biblical, redeemed picture of fatherhood uh, so that we can build on that and grow from it, and if need be, even heal from some of the experiences that we had growing up. My second uh, goal for today, and the one I'm really excited about, is I want to inspire a generation of biblical dads and granddads, because I think dads are amazing. I think being a dad is amazing. It's the most fulfilling thing I've done in my entire life. It trumps uh, every accomplishment. I was telling Jackson yesterday that uh, when uh, our kids were really little, I was signed up for the first time in a PhD program, and Man had some health issues, and I had to withdraw from that. It was kind of this dream I had been building up to, and I was really disappointed. And I came to a Bible study I was leading, and there was a guy there, Larry Sterling, older, wiser guy. And he saw that I looked kind of, you know, discouraged and deflated, and because I had just withdrawn from this program. And he asked me what was up, and I told him, and he said, put his hand on my shoulder and said, Don't worry, George you're going to get your Ph. dad, and that's way more valuable than your Ph.D. And I was like, yeah, yeah, thanks. That really 
helped and encouraged me. And so I want to hopefully inspire some of you guys out there to, to grab a hold of this amazing concept of fatherhood. Um, and I want to start by sharing the, the very last words in the Old Testament. Any idea what they are? How would you end the Old Testament? Before Jesus comes, before the redemption of the world, what's God's parting shot, uh, his parting idea from the whole Old Testament? What do you think that would be about? To return the heart to the parents to the children. Well, you're cheating. <laughs> no, good, read it. Go ahead, read it. Yeah. He will turn the heart start, to start in verse 5. So here's this, think about this, this final thought of God is that I'm going to send someone who's going to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. I'm going to restore something that's broken societally, that when John the Baptist comes and he prepares the way for Jesus, a huge part of that is restoring this heart for fatherhood. Turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the children back to their fathers. So let's start with the first big idea. God is a father by nature. It's how he describes himself. It's one of the key attributes. It's the first person of the Trinity, God the Father, uh, God reveals himself as a father to Israel in ex Exodus when he tells Moses to go tell Pharaoh to let the people go. He tells him, use these words, Israel is my firstborn son, let my son go. And so here God, this is the first uh, thought of God showing himself as a father. Deuteronomy 32, 6, Moses asks, is this how you repay the Lord you foolish and unwise people, is he not your father, your creator who made you and formed you? So God presents himself as a father, reveals himself as a father. Jesus reveals himself as the son of God. He made over 150 references in the gospels to God as his father. He re he's referred to as the son of God 47 times. He taught us to relate to God as our Father. When He was being uh, ascended into heaven, before He ascended into heaven, He's talking with uh, Mary at the tomb and He says, Don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go and tell my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father. So He's teaching us to relate to God. As a father, he even taught us to pray, our father who art in heaven, not our boss, not our Lord, our father. God wants us to relate to him as a child relates to his father. What about the Holy Spirit? Is he involved in this fatherhood thing at all? Well, the Holy Spirit reaffirms that God is our father. Romans 8, 15 through 16 says, you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Ab is the Hebrew word for father. Abba means daddy, this very close, intimate relationship. Not an angry, distant God, but a, a, a close, affectionate father. Galatians 4, 6, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So God himself is described as a father and having god as your father is the greatest privilege anyone can have look what the bible says first john 3 1 see what love the father has lavished on us that jesus died on the cross for our sins well, that's not what it says is it see jesus dying on the cross isn't the high watermark of god's love the high watermark of god's love 
is that he loved you enough not just to forgive you, but to bring you into his family. That's the excessive, lavish expression of God's love. Romans 8, 28 through 29, we know that those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. What shall we say to these things? If God's for us, who can be against us? This is the greatest privilege you have in life is that God welcomes you into his family to be your father and love you the same way that he loves the son. There's no greater privilege than to be a child of God. I love this quote from J.I. Packer. It says, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity... Find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. Everything that is distinctively Christian is summed up in the knowledge of the fatherhood of God. Father is the Christian name for God. Old Testament, for the Jews, it's Yahweh. For the Muslims, it's it's Allah. For us, for Christians, it's daddy. This is what sets Christianity apart from every cult, every other religion. Only Christianity does God invite us to be his children, and he commits himself to be our father, to bring us into his divine heavenly family. And so what do we learn about fatherhood from God because he is the role model and this is this is a great thing as we begin to want to start to redeem our image of fatherhood our fathers are not the example of God God is the example of what our fathers should have been all right so we got to make sure we get it in the right order God doesn't want us to take our fathers and project an image onto him of what we think a father is like. He wants us to take his image and project it onto fatherhood and say, that's what fathers should be like. Okay, so what do we learn from God about fatherhood? Well, the first thing we see is that a father forms a family. Kind of duh, right? Uh, if you don't have a family, you're not a father, right? You're a single guy doing whatever he wants. All right, so this first idea is that God forms a family. God created everything. He's the source of all things. Acts 17, 24 through 25 says, The Lord God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life, and breath and everything so god is the source of everything all right turn to one someone and say god's your source it's just what it is whether you like it or not he gives you your life your breath your everything god's fatherhood is the source of family and this is this great verse from Ephesians 3, 14 through 15. I want to take a look at this. It says, for this reason I bow, I kneel before the Father, and that word for father in the Greek is pater, from whom every family, that Greek word is patria, in heaven on earth is named, onomazo, right? And so this word onomazo means is derived from. Right? So I want you to keep that in mind. It means it's derived from. So when it's named, it means it comes from, it's, it's derived from, and it's a play on words in the Greek. So patria is literally and metaphorically derived from pater. So the word family in the Greek literally comes from the word father. Father is the root word of family. And the idea that Paul is communicating is that 
family comes from God the Father. The whole concept, the whole idea, the whole existence of family is grounded in God as Father. It comes from Him. If there's no God, there's no family. Okay? If there's no Father, there's no family in this sense. Our identity is rooted in our relationship with God as our Father, as modeled by Jesus in his relationship with the Father. So, forming a heavenly family is God's ultimate purpose. If anyone ever asks you, why did God make the world? It's because he wants a family. That's his ultimate goal. Look what the Bible says. In, his, in love, he, God, predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. What's God's will? What does he want for you? To be in his family. That's God's will. Anybody ever wonder, what's God's will for me? Now you know. Just check that one off. You now know. God's will for me is to be a part of his family, to engage in that relationship. All right? Galatians 4, 4 through 5 says, When the set time had fully come, so as God is moving all of history to a convergence moment, that's what that means, when the set time had come, the God is arranging all of human history to come to a climax point. God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. God's ultimate game plan is to form a family with you in it where he's your father and you get to experience the glorious benefit of being loved by an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good, all-wise, all-loving creator of all things, right? That's a pretty good thing. Is that a pretty good thing? Am I the only one who thinks that's a good thing? That's a really good thing, right? So how does that pertain to fathers? So God made Adam to be a father. And so in Acts 17, 26, we, we looked at 24 through 25. Look at how the verse continues. Talked about God being the source of everything. And then it says, from one man, God made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole world. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. So here's the idea that God is the source of anything, and he makes Adam to be the source of everyone. That makes sense? So God puts the, every person's existence is, is in Adam, and Adam's fatherhood is intended to represent God as a father on earth. Remember, we're created in his image to represent who he is. Adam was created to represent God's fatherhood as the source of all things on earth. And that was designed, fatherhood is intended. So when fatherhood works right, it points people to God. People experience the reality of who God is in their families from their fathers. It generates the safety and security and trust to believe in God. That's the way fatherhood's supposed to work. So God made Matt, Adam in his own image perfect, right? And we see that in Luke 3, where Luke's going through the genealogy of Jesus, and he takes it from Jesus and works backwards. And look at what Luke says. The, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of, who was the son of Adam, who's the son of God. So Luke takes this and says, Adam was, in essence, the first human that God, not in essence, was in reality, the first human that God made. And it's highlighting Adam's origin from God in his image. But Adam sinned, and he broke his relationship with God as father. 
And that results in separation from God and his life. And so Adam's sin brought death to his family. I mean, think about this, because this is going to tie into us as fathers. Adam's sin had repercussions for his whole family, because he is the source of his family. Everything is derived from him as a father. And so Adam can now no longer pass on God's perfect image. Genesis 5, 1 through 3, God, when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son, notice, in his own likeness, in his own image. Here's the reality. Adam passed on his brokenness instead of God's perfection. His firstborn son, Cain, carried on his legacy of death by killing his own brother, perpetuating that brokenness in the family. As dads, we pass on our brokenness to our kids. This is why when we talk about dads, it's often a painful discussion because our dads, however they were broken, they're the source of our family and they passed on that brokenness to us so hear me guys it's going to get better i know this is kind of like heavy uh but our degree of brokenness limits the health of our families i want to say that again because i really want you to hear it our degree of brokenness limits the health of our families we have a unique ability to limit the healthiness of our family so what's the solutions don't stay broken <laughs> all right turn to a guy and say don't stay broken all right don't stay broken because if you do you're going to pass it on how many of you enjoyed the brokenness of your own father no takers no one all right how many of you want to pass on the brokenness that was passed on to you or that you accumulated on your own by your own choices. All right, how many of you would love to pass on a less broken legacy than you received? All right, what's the solution to that? Dad, Jesus, don't stay broken, right? This is the idea. Dads, don't stay broken. Let's stop passing on a legacy of brokenness. See, we needlessly carry wounds, shame, guilt, anger, frustration from our formative years. And it's time to man up and stop living in that brokenness from our childhood. And this is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13. He said, when I was a child, I, I spoke like a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So guys, here's the challenge for us that when we were kids and our, our dads passed on their brokenness, we didn't have the maturity to filter that. We didn't have the maturity to understand that the, uh, the abuse or the neglect or the, the mistreatment or the, the shaming that we went through as kids had more to do with our dads than it did with us. And we just assumed this is who I am. This is what I'm supposed to be. This is what it means to be a man. I'm watching this powerful person in my life act this way. This is what it must mean to be a man. That's how kids understand their parents are always right. Until you get to be what? Like 11, 12? And then they're never right until you're like 26, 27? And then they start being right again? Right? And so the idea is, so let's, let's stop living like kids and let's get fully restored as whole and complete man and so my commitment to you guys is in 2025 we're going to press into this idea of soul restoration this idea of understanding that god wants me to live 
as a fully loved and fully loving man. And any time that I feel defensive with my wife, uh, impatient with my children, um, angry when I'm driving, these are all indicators of brokenness in my life. And instead of making excuses for them or blaming other people for them, I want to commit to you guys, because I've got my I, you ask my wife, I've got my own list of brokenness in my life that still impacts how I behave. And I, I, I want 2025 to be the year that I get the, a lot of those areas restored so that I can live as a fully loved, that confidence that I'm fully loved, no one's taking anything from me, no one's threatening me, no one's after me, no one's trying to make my life miserable. Those are all just the brokenness talking. Does this make sense? And I want to get restored, and I want to lean into that. I want to man up to that. You know, when, when Sal and I were doing construction together, sometimes these younger guys we'd have working with us would take a tool and they'd misuse it, right? We read this, I don't know if you guys know what a ship auger is. Uh, it's a big drill that drills big holes, and some of these guys would be like fighting it, and they'd bend it, and then you'd go to use it, and it's got this like 18-inch drill bit that's got a slight bend in it. What happens when you try to use that? It's like, right? And it's just shaking you to pieces and it's making a big old hole instead of a nice clean one. What's the solution? Fix it. It's not, hey, let me figure out how to cope with this. But isn't that what most men do? Or I'm just going to sit here and fume and curse and, and blame the guys for making it like this. No, the solution, if I want to do quality work with my life, is to fix the things that are broken so that I actually function the way God intended for a father to function. So the second big idea here is that a father provides a life not just a living. So what was the first big idea? Father forms a family. Turn to someone and say, a father forms a family. <laughs> tell, tell someone else that. Hey, a father forms a family. <laughs> All right, so the, that's the first big idea we learn from God. The second big idea is that a father provides a life, not just a living. And that's something that uh, is one of these myths that's been perpetuated in our culture, in, even in our legal system, right? So if, if parents separate, they get divorced, what's required of the dad legally? Financial support, All right? What do we call it? Alimony, right? It's, it's something that's required of the father to pay. You know what's not required of the father by law? Emotional support, relational support, educational support. None of that's required because in our culture, we've relegated dads to just being financial providers. And guys have by and large accepted this, that their main contrib contribution is paying the bills. They go to work, they pay the bills, they don't have to provide a life if they're providing a living. Well, we see something different from God. God is the sustainer of life. God sustains everything he creates. Hebrews 1.3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by the power of his word. Colossians 1.16, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or powers, rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. God as a father, as the creator, as the originator of a family, sustains everything. So God made fathers to be life-giving. Fathers reflect God when they support their families. All right, so Luke 11 uh, says, Which of you fathers, if your son asks you for a fish, will hand him a snake instead? Anyone ever thought about doing that? 
right? Or a loaf of bread says, here's a, here's a stone, chew on this. And Jesus says, no, if you earthly fathers get this idea, intuitively you know that you're supposed to provide good things for your children, how much more will your heavenly father provide the Holy Spirit for those who ask? All right? And so here's this idea that whatever a father produces, he should support. Kind of no-brainer, right, guys? If you made it, sustain it. If you gave birth to it, if you impregnated someone and you gave life to that child, it's your responsibility. It's your responsibility to sustain it. God designed dads and moms to sustain families. Families are meant to be life-giving. When God made the woman, he didn't go back to the dirt to make her, right? Only the man was made out of the dirt. So you can turn to the guy next to you and say, you're, you're a dirt bag, <laughs> right? It's biblical, <laughs> right? You're made from the dirt. When God made the woman, he didn't go back to the dirt to make her. He made her instead out of the man. And this is important. God's communicating something he wanted her connection to be to the man, not the soil. He wanted the man to be her source and her sustainer. So the man's responsible to sustain, to be life-giving to his wife as well, because by God's design, he's her source. Now, I know that doesn't jive well with feminist theology and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm not the, I'm just the messenger. I didn't write it. Uh, God did it that way by his intent and his design. Then God's intention was that the man and woman would come together and have children because God wanted the family to sustain and support children. This relationship of dependence in the family points back to our dependence on God. That's the point. Why does God make it where we have to depend on each other, where we have to rely on each other? Why is our, our culture that's being so influenced by the devil, so hell-bent literally on convincing you that you need to be independent and not depend on anyone because it undermines the foundational principle of life that we depend on God for everything. That's what we're supposed to learn in families, and we're supposed to learn that that's good, that's healthy, that's where we thrive, that's where we flourish, is in, in the right kind of dependence as we grow and mature to a place where now other people can be dependent upon us. If all we do is learn to be independent, we're of use to no one. Growing up in an intact family is life-giving. Studies have shown that having a loving, engaged father at home for your whole childhood is the single greatest advantage that a person can have. It trumps economics, it trumps genetics, it trumps location, it trumps ethnicity. Every single factor in life is dramatically overshadowed by the power of having an engaged father living in the home for your entire life. So here are some of the stats. As infants, infants in families with fathers tend to sleep better and longer. Do you know that? It's interesting. Just having a dad around, kids sleep better. They're more physically and mentally active. They have longer attention spans than kids who grow up without dads. Children in families with fathers tend to have better physical health. There was a study done of 68,000 children in America, and they found that children who lived in intact families had the best health by far, even better than mom and stepdad. Original father, original mother in the home produces the best physical health for children, empirically. 
They have, they're better at calming and self-soothing. They're less aggressive and have better control of their emotions. As adolescents uh, with their fathers, they're more willing to take on challenging tasks. They're more persistent in sticking with an activity. If dad isn't in the home, you're more likely to quit the important things in life. Having a dad creates a resilience and a grit in your character that isn't there if your dad leaves. You have more mature social skills than when a dad is not present. What about when you become an adult? What about adults who grew up in families where, with fathers? Did you know that they tend to be more empathetic as adults? This idea that moms are more empathetic has actually been disproven uh, empirically through research studies. The dads actually teach their kids more empathy. They have better relationships with their spouses. They have lower divorce rates. In fact, the number one indicator, the predictor of whether or not you will get divorced is whether or not your parents were divorced. If your parents stuck it out, even if it was difficult, that almost bulletproofs you from getting a divorce. Isn't that cool? And you ever heard this, this idea, another myth that's out there that is it's better for the kids for us to separate so that there's peace in the home? Anybody ever heard that? That's an absolute lie. So the studies clearly show that the, obviously the best is a loving home where there's not a lot of conflict. That's obviously the best, but kids fare far better in intact households where, con where there is conflict than they do in broken homes where there's peace. Isn't that interesting? All right? So this idea that, oh, we're going to separate for the kids. No, you're not. <laughs> you're separating for you. Just own it. All right? Kids with families where the fathers are in the home have higher incomes later in life as adults. All right? So God designed the families to be life-giving. Here's the problem. 90% of kids in America will spend their entire childhood living with moms, but only 54% will spend their entire childhoods living with their fathers. That represents 37.5 million people who are growing up without a consistent father figure in the home. And all those benefits we just read do not apply to them. The single greatest advantage you can have in life is an intact family where mom and dad are sticking it out and being there to provide a life-giving environment for you. 24% of kids live only with a single mom, right? And this is part of our legal system that tends to award custody to moms over dads, even though the evidence is, is to the, the contrary. So the, the solution is what? Stay married. stay married. Dads, just for being a dad, stay married. Just stay married because you're a dad, because it's going to be worth it for your kids, all right? Just stay married. Don't stay broken and stay married, right? God hates divorce. Malachi 2.14 says, The Lord's God's been witness, so he's watching, between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you've dealt treacherously, yet she's your companion and wife by covenant. He did not make them one having, did he not make them one having a remnant of the Spirit? And why? Why did God make you one? What does he want from it? Godly offspring. Therefore, Take heed to your spirit. It's not just about what you want out of your marriage. God wants something out of your marriage. He wants kids that grow up in a life-giving, God-honoring environment that will be in his family because your life pointed them to him. All right? For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce for it covers one's garment with violence. So here's the hard truth, guys. Work it out. Don't walk away because divorce is a destructive act of violence against your kids. Divorce is associated with significant risks for children, including substance abuse, addiction, mental and physical health problems, and poor educational outcomes. The depressed, withdrawn score for children living with a single mother was high, especially 
for boys. Boys especially have it rough when dad's not in the home. Antisocial behavior was higher among those living with mothers than those living with intact families. Does it make sense, guys? That this, you play such a key role in your kids' lives. Children of divorce actually suffer the most in adulthood. The impact of divorce hits them most cruelly as they go in search of love, sexual intimacy, and commitment. They, their lack of inner images of man and woman in a stable relationship and their me memory of their parents' failure to sustain a marriage badly hobbles their search, leading them to heartbreak and even despair. And this was a, after a review of like 300 different studies on the impact of divorce on kids, all right, that it actually is going to hit them the hardest later in life as they go to try to build a marriage. So the last thing here is a father teaches his kids. So what was the first one? What does the father do? Forms a family. What's the second thing a dad does? Gives life, provides a life, not just a living. The third thing a father does is he teaches his kids. And this is, again, I, there's, there was so much. I had like 17 pages of notes, uh, that I, stuff I wanted to say about fatherhood because it's so much, uh, so powerful. But I'm picking the three that I think are the most uh, influenced, um, diminished by our culture uh, that says dads can't teach, dads are dumb, and uh, you know, you really need a, a, a mom to teach. Uh, ladies, if you ever say that, you know, because I've heard women say this, oh, I, I could never leave my husband with the kids. That's feeding into a lie from the devil. Kids thrive with their dads. They need, uh, and I know you're like worried, well, he, it's going to be dangerous. <laughs> yes, yes, that's the point. Yes, that's what they need, right? And we're going to, I'm going to show you why. Kids need danger. They need dad, right? So God gives dad the, the primary responsibility for teaching kids. He says, fathers, don't provoke your children to anger. Hear this, guys. Your kids develop anger issues when you're not involved. We provoke them to anger by not bringing them up, training them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Jesus himself modeled this with his own father. He said, I do nothing of my own authority, but speak just as the father taught me. So even Jesus is modeling this father-child dynamic of learning, right? Dads must be present to teach. This is what going back to guys stay married, right? Deuteronomy 6 talks about teaching your kids as you sit in the house, as you lie down, as you wake up, as you walk in the way, as you are driving on the commute. Dads, be engaged. Have conversations. Do you know that dads ask questions that moms never ask? And it actually develops more cognitive learning in their children. Moms are very much tell me the details. Right? Dads are not about the details, right? Mom's like, well, what was she wearing? What was the flavor of the cake? You know, and all these things. And dads are like, why'd they get married? You know, and the kid's like, huh, I don't know. Right? They don't seem like a good match. Wonder what they saw in each other, right? Those are the kind of questions dads ask that, that take their kids' brains in a totally different direction. Right? So dads have a unique superpower to teach kids. Right? Train a child up in the way he should go. When he's old, he won't depart from it. Children whose fathers are home and involved tend to have higher IQs. Do you know that? You want to raise your kid's IQ? Keep dad in the house. Right? It's going to raise it. They tend to have higher IQs. They tend to have better language and cognitive skills. This is one of the stats I thought was really interesting. Children whose dads read bedtime stories to them at six months of age had better language skills at age three, regardless of whether or not the mother read to them at all. Just dads reading bedtime stories to kids improves their scholastic achievement when they hit school. So dads, set your kids on a right path. This is the key. Showing the right path is the most important thing 
dads teach their kids. Look at what uh, Solomon wrote in Proverbs. Hear my son and receive my sayings and the years of your life will be many. I have taught you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in right paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hindered. When you run, you will not stumble. Take firm hold of instruction. Do not let go. Keep her for she is your life. Dads, what are you teaching your kids? How to navigate life. That's the power of what a dad teaches. It's not about their algebra scores on the SAT. That's not what is going to keep them from stumbling. Their ability to parse out Elizabethan English is not what's going to make or break their life. What's going to make or break their life is the path that you set them on as a dad. And so the, the, here's some of the life-shaping impact. These are the last stats I'll give you. When a dad's engaged at home, kids have less school delinquency. They have less drugs and alcohol use. Daughters delay sexual activity and have lower teen pregnancy. In fact, the higher the quality of father-daughter relationship, it's uniquely protective against risky sexual behavior in daughters. You want your daughter to not get pregnant or an STD, have a great relationship with her dads. That is uniquely protective for her. Girls that don't have that seek that affection. They seek that security outside of the family when their brains aren't fully developed and they're interacting with boys who don't even have brains. They just have balls. And all they want is to take advantage. I can't believe I said that. Uh, all they want to do is take advantage of your daughters. Understand that, guys. You were there, right? Think about the world that your daughters are navigating in. Right? It should scare all of us. Kids have lower levels of depression and anxiety when their dads are engaged. They have higher high school and college graduation rates. Right? So teach your kids to love God so that it will go well. Right? We saw this in Deuteronomy already. I want to read the last verse. Verse 17 says, As you teach them to do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may go well with you. When you teach your kids to love God, life's going to go well for them. If they don't learn that from you because you don't love God, you don't prioritize being a part of a church family, being in his word, understanding what the Bible says, if you don't prioritize those things, then they won't prioritize those things. And it won't go well with them. Teach your kids to love others. Look at what 1 Corinthians 13 says. If I could speak all the languages of the earth and angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor, even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Dad, teach your kids to love people. Be someone that welcomes others into your home. Teach them what it's like to give generously to people who are struggling. Show them what it means to actually love in a genuine and authentic way. Be engage in their lives doesn't matter what else your kids learn if they don't learn to love they haven't learned anything important teach your kids to handle stress this is one of my favorite favorite ones you know what the greatest cause of childhood stress is any guesses dads dads are the single greatest cause of childhood stress. We raise our kids' cortisol levels higher and faster than anyone else in their life. We tend to play in stressful, unpredictable, scary, and risky ways. Right? Any dads do that? Dad, anybody ever toss their kid into the air as an infant? No ability to land. You ever thought about what that does to them? 
right? They aren't going to spot that landing. If you aren't there, it's going to hurt. It could cause permanent damage. We wrestle with them. We chase them through the house. We jump out of dark rooms and scare them, right? We tease them. We make fun of them, right? We, we create enormous stress in our children's lives. We present them with challenging and frustrating tasks, right? Dad, can you tie my shoe? I think you can do it. Well, no, I can't. Well, give it a try, right? No, I don't want to. Go ahead. Well, you guys are going without shoes today. Let's go, right? That's dads. That's how dads function in their kids' lives. We tend to never let our kids win, right? Jackson knows that he beats me at stuff now. It's legit, <laughs> right? Because I never let him win as a kid, right? Ever, right? Ellie still hasn't won. Oh, well, you win at something. You win at brain stuff, uh, right? But if we're playing a sport or something, right? Dads never let their kids win. We frustrate them. That's frustrating. Moms are like, let them win. Come on. Let them do more push-ups than you. Like, no. It's, not, it's just not. There's something unjust about that in life, right? Dads also allow their kids to do uh, risky, dangerous things, right? We let them climb stuff. We let them jump off high stuff. We encourage them to jump in deep stuff where they can't swim. All right, just go ahead. Yeah, launch yourself into an eight-foot deep pool. You've never swum in your life. Why not? That's right. Moms are like, what are you doing? Dads are like, this is part of life. But in all those stressful situations, dads exhibit confidence, strength, humor, and reassurance. And what does that teach our kids? It teaches them to contextualize stress. That stress is not a universal thing, it's a momentary thing. And it can actually be enjoyable, and it can have good elements to it, and it teaches them to recover from it quickly. So kids get really, you, you jump out at a kid in the middle of the night and scare them, right? It's going to scare them, but you laugh about it, you give them a hug. What's going to happen to all the, that cortisol? It's just going to drain out of their system, and they realize, okay, it's okay, I'm okay. Life can be scary, and I'm still okay. All right? This is something that dads uniquely teach their kids, and it gives them the confidence to take calculated risks in the future. One of the biggest challenges with single moms that are helicopter moms is their kids grow up constantly anxious because they've never learned how to manage stress and get over it. Last thing, dads, teach your kids that they can always come home to you. Right, and this is the prodigal son parable uh, where the son is off, he's, he's off the deep end doing his own thing, and he finally comes to his senses and says, you know, even the people that are in the worst relationships with my dad have it better off than I do. There's something about my dad that makes all his relationships better than my best ones. And so as the son came back, he's like, I'm going to tell my dad I'm unworthy, but look at the dad. So while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion for him, ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Dad, always be the safe place your kids can come home to. Teach them that, that you are a rock, you are an anchor, you are a landing pad for them. Whenever they're in trouble, you can always come home and Granddads, I would say that you fit into that category well, too. And guys, I know there are a lot of people in the church family that never had a dad like this. If you're a dad who's been solid, you were like, I'm a solid spiritual dad. I want to challenge you to start being a spiritual dad for the church. Be there for people. Pray for people. Let them know, hey, you can always come to me. Hey, you don't have a place for Thanksgiving? Why don't you come to our house? Be a part of our family. I'll be a spiritual dad in your life. You're not going to fix everything. You're not going to compensate for the failures of the, their dad, but you can help provide a landing place for them. So uh, just to, to sum it up, dads, you matter. Turn to a guy and say, you matter. You matter, guys. Dads, you matter. Granddads, you matter. 
immeasurably to your families. So stay married. Don't stay broken. And set your kids on the right path. Amen? Amen. All right, let me pray for us. Father, thank you for uh, your example of what it means to be a father. And I pray you'd help all the men in here to embrace the example that you set. May we pass on a legacy of your love, not our brokenness we meet. May we be an example of faithful, committed marriages, even if we have to work through tough seasons. And may we have the wisdom to teach our kids the things that matter most. Would you bless our conversations around the lunch tables? Thank you for the food you always provide for us, God. We're grateful that you're our Father. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you guys.